Hello and welcome to our webinar on basic data analysis. We're going to go ahead and get started. So good afternoon to those of you on the east, central, and west coasts, and good morning to those of you joining us from the Hawaii or Pacific regions. This webinar is being presented by Capacity for Health. We're the Capacity Building Assistance Program of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. We're actually funded by the CDC to provide free capacity building, so free support. We do a lot of trainings and webinars, but we also do one-on-one -on -one individual support for community-based organizations who do HIV prevention work. And we work around a whole variety of topics, everything from organizational development, board development, strategic planning, fund development, to work around specific evidence-based interventions. And we also do a lot of work in the areas of monitoring and evaluation. And today's webinar is in our monitoring and evaluation series. So we'll talk a little bit more about how to access the individualized capacity building assistance at the end of today's webinar, and we'll put this contact information up again at the end of the presentation. Before we get started with our contact, just a few announcements. You guys have all been automatically muted. If you would like to speak, you can actually click on your raise the hand icon, and we can unmute you. However, we can only do this if you have entered your audio PIN, if you're um, listening to the presentation through a telephone. Also, if you have multiple people around one computer, if you can just chat in your contact information for us, that would be really helpful so that we can include you on any follow-up or sending out the slide sets or information related to this presentation. We'll have lots of opportunities for conversation, both live if you wish to raise your hand. Also, you can type in questions using the questions feature, which is the lower right-hand side of your webinar control panel. And you can actually do that at any time during the webinar. If you're having any technical issues or if you have questions about the content we'll be covering, please feel free to chat in those questions using your questions feature. And finally, today's webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be available on our website along with an online training version of this material, which we'll talk a little bit more about at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Jessica Manta Meyer. Jess and I have actually worked together in a number of organizations, a number of ways, for almost 15 years. She has experience both as a direct service provider and as a manager and director. She's done a lot of work in women's health and also work with LGBT youth and leadership development. Her recent work has also been around after school programs. So she is currently working as a program evaluator at a small firm in Oakland called Public Profit. And we're very pleased to have her joining us here for um, the second version of the basic data analysis webinar. She'll also be back with us for two additional webinars. This is the first in a series of three webinars on effective data management and analysis. We'll talk a little bit more about those upcoming webinars when we get to the end of today's content. So without further ado, here is Jessica. Good morning or uh, good afternoon, everyone. Before we dive into the content, I wanted to take a moment to review our objectives so you have a sense of where we're going. Um, we're going to, um, well, by the end of this webinar, you will understand the importance of checking data before you analyze it. You will understand how to organize data uh, into a spreadsheet specifically. We're going to look at three methods to analyze data, frequencies, centers, and subgroup comparisons. We intend that you're more confident about interpreting data by the end of the webinar. Um, and we're uh, going to take a minute to identify some steps to build on or improve your current data analysis at the end. We're in the introductory materials right now. Then we're going to move on to uh, the four steps of analyzing data. We'll talk a little more about those four steps in a moment. And then we're going to close with next steps and additional resources. This webinar will take uh, about an hour. Shared Action, which is a project of the AIDS Project Los Angeles, has developed this six-step evaluation framework. Um, we're going to look today at steps five and step six. So we're going to look at analyzing information and developing conclusions. That's the bulk of what we're going to be looking at today. Um, but we're also going to spend some time thinking about how to share this data analysis to report out those findings, um, although not necessarily in a formal report, but thinking about setting up a presentation. Here we are at the four steps of data analysis. Step one, organize your data into a spreadsheet. Step two, check and if necessary, recheck your spreadsheet for data entry errors. Step three, this is the heart of it, ask questions of the data. You may need to create new variables. You're going to find out how often responses occur. You're going to look at the centers or the, aver the average and a couple of other kinds of centers. 
um, of responses, and then we're going to look at comparing subgroups. And finally, step four, sharing your data, which gets back to the kind of presenting your data at the end. Before uh, we get underway, again, uh, just to let you know our expectations of you, we believe that uh, you will understand basic mathematical concepts, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, how to figure a percentage. Uh, we do not expect that you know, need to know how to use Excel. However, um, if you are working with lots of data, you probably will want to be doing uh, your data analysis in Excel or Google Docs. The intermediate data analysis webinar in a few weeks will cover a lot more about specific Excel tricks um, and tools and formulas you can use in data analysis. Uh, this webinar will focus on some really basic data analysis that anyone can understand or do with their programs. The kind of data we're going to be talking about today is primarily closed-ended questions, questions that generate quantitative data or data um, uh, that has a limited possible number of responses. For example, check boxes, ratings on a scale of one to five, multiple choice questions. You can see the example here in front of you. Um, Closed-ended questions can also include fill-in-the-blank questions, as long as the response is specific. How old are you? Um, how many sexual partners did you have last month? Now we would like to take a minute to find out a little bit more about who's on the line with us. Um, so we are going to ask you to pull in the response that best matches the option below. What best, which option best describes you? Are you brand new to working with data? Um, you've collected some data, but you don't really know what to do with it. You have sort of spreadsheets sitting around, but you're not really sure. You have paper copies of surveys. You don't really know what to do with that. Um, you've collected data. You've used Excel a little bit. Or you do use Excel pretty often. Um, but you certainly want to learn more. So take a moment, please, to pull in your, uh, the response that best describes you. You should see that on your screen. And we're going to wait a, a few minutes um, to get, oh, great. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Now we have, uh, you can see the results. So we have some folks who are brand new to working with data. For those of you um, who are doing that, um, who are in that position. Uh, this webinar is definitely going to give you some foundational concepts uh, that you can use to start your data analysis. For those of you who've collected some data, used Excel a little bit, hopefully this will fill in a, some gaps in your information. For those of you who've used Excel often and want to learn more, um, I do recommend that you seriously think about also attending the Intermediate Data Analysis webinar in a few weeks. I think we're going to dive into some specific Excel tips that would be would be useful for you. Um, and now we're going to uh, move on with the rest of our content. Hold on, we're having a couple technical difficulties, but we're going to get there. OK, thank you. As we go through this webinar, we're going to use a case study to kind of guide our, our thinking. Um, and this case study, just briefly, is um, you've developed a six-week leadership program for HIV AIDS peer leaders. You administer a post-workshop survey that asks them some personal questions, but also some information about the knowledge that they've gained in the six-week program. And you've had several groups of people go through. So we actually have 150 or so completed surveys that we can work with um, that give us some really robust information. Here is an example of a completed case study survey. So you can see um, someone's filled in their participant ID, they've checked their gender, um, et cetera. Let's get on our analyzing data path. We're going to start by organizing that data from that survey. We organize data into a spreadsheet, um, columns and rows. This is basically a fancy way of saying a table. The column headers are our variables. So here we can see that those variables um, 
are participant ID, gender, race, ethnicity, age, etc. questions from the survey itself. The rows are records. Um, in this case, a record is going to be each individual survey, but a record could be um, a participant in your program, a bunch of data amassed about a particular participant. A record could be um, uh, a diff so a different person, a completed survey. Um, it could be information about an event that you had. If you do a series of events and you collect event level information, each event could be a separate record. It's a separate piece of data that describes one thing across several variables. Here is uh, an example of several of those surveys filled in. Each record has a value for the variable. So for example, participant number 112 has a value of East Asian for race ethnicity. Um, each cell holds one value. A um, couple of ways that this spreadsheet illustrates some best practices for doing um, setting up a spreadsheet, doing data analysis. First of all, it's a good practice to assign a number to words. So as you can see here, um, gender female is assigned the number one. Race ethnicity black is assigned the number six. It just makes it easier to handle um, your information, to um, find your frequencies, to sum up information if you can code your information as a number. Also, we never want to leave a blank cell. So each cell needs to have a value. Um, and in this case, participant number 12 did not mark um, a response for their self-rated knowledge about HIV AIDS but prior to taking the workshop. So we have added 99 missing in that cell. This is sort of towards the lower right corner of the spreadsheet um, as a way to indicate that that person did not indicate a response. That way we know something isn't missing. We don't try to hunt for it again, but that we know it actually wasn't there to begin with. Each record should have a unique identifier. Um, it, this makes it easy to track the record. First of all, it's the name of the record. So if you're working with, in an office with a couple of people about information, it's easy for you to talk. Um, say record number so-and-so had, um, had some pieces of information missing. You can use it to look back for the, in the original source. It's also a way to ensure confidentiality. You use a number or a string of numbers and letters to replace the name of the person. Um, a moment about confidentiality here before we move on. In our example here, we're already using an ID that's been assigned to a person. This is actually, I don't think, very common in our programs that people know their participant ID. Um, usually that's something that we assign after the fact. Uh, for example, we can create a unique identifier out of a string of information from their name or their date of birth. Um, but you want to be careful about linking any information to an actual person's name and think about your confidentiality policies and make sure that you're not violating those. As you go, you're going to encounter ambiguous or confusing answers. It's just the nature of this kind of work. So I have a couple of examples on the screen right here. Let me talk through them a bit. The first one, participant number 12, circled two possible responses when they rated their self, um, their knowledge prior to the workshop. They circled two and three. In this case, you would need to enter 99 missing. There's sort of no way to decide whether they were going to be a two or a three. So best practice would be to enter 99 missing for that particular response option for that particular person or record. And our second example, participant number 140, checked both female and male and then clearly crossed off male. So obviously, in this case, I would feel um, very comfortable marking this person as female in, as I create my spreadsheet, as I do my data entry. Regardless, you want to make keep a log of these decisions as you go. And the reason for this is, um, if you encounter similar situations, you want to be able to look back and, and enter the data in the same way that you did the first time and the second time and the third time so you're consistent across all of it. But secondly, if you find that you are encountering the same problem over and over or this, that people responded in a certain way, there's, a cert, there's an ambiguous answer that sort of actually repeats itself, you actually might want to change the way you respond to it and the log will show you how many times it happened. And using that unique ID, you can go back, find that record, and update 
the way that you entered it if you change your mind. Now that we've organized our data into a spreadsheet, we're going to want to save our data. We want to save it to somewhere safe, somewhere that is backed up, preferably. And we want to save it both to the past and to the future. So you want to save one set of data, such as um, HIV survey underscore raw data, sample uh, title, that gets put aside, that, that is backed up, that you don't touch again. It's your raw data. It doesn't get edited any further. So that if you have a problem later on, you can always track back to the raw data and, um, and, make any ch and, and see where the problem might have come from. But you want to save another file moving forward, such as HIV survey data to check. We're moving into the next step of our data analysis, which is checking our data. So you might save a file that moves forward into that process. You're going to create, over time, you're going to create a series of files that, that catalog each step of data analysis that you've taken. Here is a sample spreadsheet with some data entry errors. Take a moment to look that over, and please use the question feature to chat in one thing that needs to be fixed in this spreadsheet. There's several, there's several things going on here that if you looked at this, you would need to go back um, and make some changes. As you send those in, we will post your suggestions in the chat window. And once we've had a chance to get a couple of those responses, um, we will move on to um, more specific details about steps to take to check your data. Great. Um, so as we can see, um, there are a couple of, of issues that are fun. Great. You guys are totally on top of it. Thank you. Um, first of all, first, first record, gender, first and third record, gender has been moved over to the left, and everything else seems to have followed after it. We've, we've lost gender, and the race ethnicity um, variable has been moved into the gender column, and we've lost everything else. We've also got an error message. This is actually an error message you can see in Excel, divided by zero, so something funky is going on there. Um, 2M and 3M, thank you, someone pointed that out. And we have one A where male is coded um, with two different numbers. And finally, um, someone is 193 years old? I think not. So um, these are different problems that you would be able to easily see with a spot check. Um, you get your data entered, and you just take a look at your spreadsheet. Um, and it's really easy to see some of the major errors. Checking your data, start with a spot check. We've already done that in the previous slide. We recommend checking a, a good sample of your records. You don't have to check them all, 3%, at least 10. You can do this by just checking every nth case, figure out about how many 3% would be, and then check every 15th one in the case of, um, in the example here, checking every 15th record. Um, would be what you would do if you had 542 or so records. But you can figure out how many would get you 10 and then check through those. Um, I like to use random.org to just give me a random set of numbers in the range I need and check those. The key here is you want to fix errors, check again, fix errors, check again. And you want to fix any one-time errors you encounter, but the real, uh, the real Interest is finding systematic errors, so errors that recur again and again. In the example that um, you were able to chat in about, we saw that uh, race ethnicity had been shifted one cell over to the left, displacing the gender values, and all the subsequent values had been shifted over to the left, too, it looked like. So that would be an example of a systematic error. It's happening more than once. Maybe it's an import issue or a data entry issue, um, but you definitely want to go back and Check, fix the errors, but also think about fixing the process that led to those errors. And you want to repeat until you're reasonably sure you've cleaned up the errors in your data. 
Now that you've checked your data, again, you want to save backwards in time, data is checked. Check that off. And save forward in time, data to analyze, moving into the ask questions of your data portion of our four-step path. Um, if you have any questions at this point about anything we've covered so far, please use the questions feature to, ch feature to chat that in. If you have any questions in the future, go ahead and chat them in as you go, and, um, and I will address them at different points throughout. But please do, please do let me know if you have any questions or if anything I say is, is not clear. We're moving on to asking questions of the data. What questions are we going to ask depends on the context of our program. Going back to the shared action evaluation framework in step three, they encourage folks to develop evaluation questions that guide your data collection, but they also guide your analysis. So if you have evaluation questions, goals and objectives, you will want to remind yourself of those to guide the questions that you ask. Definitely had an experience of people asking whatever questions they can about data and losing track of where, what questions they need to be asking based on their evaluation questions, their context, their funder requirements, their goals, and their objectives. As we build an interpretation of the data, we want to know uh, what trends we notice, what stands out for us. Um, how does the data answer these evaluation questions or these objectives? Remind ourselves of the context. And the context can be the context of our program or our community that we work in. The content, context can be the context of the data collection. The survey was placed in a, in a funny spot somewhere in our program, and so some people filled it out, some people didn't. That kind of context can also be really important. And finally, um, good evaluation always raises additional questions. So you'll want to, to be keeping track of anything that your data doesn't answer, but that you now want to try to answer in the future. Keep in mind that if someone else looks at the same information, they should be able to see the same interpretation of your data. This will help guide you into drawing reasonable conclusions from the data. Set aside some time to do this. Uh, it does take time to do this in a meaningful way. Uh, data entry, data analysis is a little bit of a, a detail-oriented task, so it can, uh, detail-oriented detail -oriented tasks can take some time. For a two-page questionnaire with about 30 variables, you might want to set aside eight to 10 hours to do the analysis, but this is a very rough estimate. But that's the kind of time, magnitude of time we're talking about here. The first step is we might need to create some new data. Doesn't mean you're creating something out of nothing, but you're creating something out of the data that you already have. Um, for example, classic example, change from pre to post. Find the difference between the knowledge before and after the workshop. Well, you simply subtract their rating of themselves after the workshop from, rather, you subtract the rating of themselves before the workshop from the rating of themselves after the workshop to get the change. Create a new column and calculate the difference. That is actually now a new variable that you get to work with and analyze on its own, the variable change in self-rated knowledge. You might also want to group variables. For example, if you're a program that primarily serves 20-somethings and 30-somethings, but you have a few people who are younger than that and a few people who are older than that, you might want to just reduce data clutter by moving people into creating a new variable, age new, and those older folks and those younger folks get placed into um, under 20 or 40 and over categories as seen in this example. You want to remember to always carry forward the original age information, the original age values for, um, for everyone else into the new variable as well. You also may need to group them into age ranges, say, for because that's, that's your funder um, has those age ranges for their report or whatever. What new variables um, are you working with in your data? I'm interested to know a little bit about what kinds of data, what kinds of information people are working with. So please use the questions feature uh, to chat in uh, the kinds of new variables that you might create using the data that you work with. 
And while I wait to hear some of those, I'm going to go ahead and sorry, skip ahead. Go ahead and move on to talk about finding frequencies, how often certain values occur. But please do um, continue to chat in anything that you, the kinds of data that you're working with, and any new variables that you might be creating. Frequencies. Count up the number of times a value appears. Divide it by the total number of valid responses. We'll talk about valid responses in a second. And multiply by 100. Finding the frequencies, we mean we're finding the number of times each piece of information or each value comes up. Um, and usually we report that as a percentage, hence the multiply by 100%. What are valid responses? Valid responses um, mean that you are excluding from your total responses those records with missing responses. For example, we have 156 surveys. 14 people skipped the question, how many sexual partners did you have last month? Not that surprising. Some people don't want to answer that question. Um, but for this variable, you will have 156 minus 14, or 142 valid records. Uh, then you divide your total number of responses of a given of that value, of a given value, the value you're looking for, by the total number of valid responses. So if 49 respondents said they had one sexual partner last month, um, the frequency of the response 1 would be 49 divided by 142, not the 156 but divided by 142 times 100% is 34.5%. The reason why we only want to use valid responses is because for those other 14 people, we don't know what they would have said. Maybe they're having lots of sex last month. Maybe they had no sex. Maybe they had no partners last month. Um, but we don't want to include them because that's making the assumption uh, about what their response would have been. So we just exclude them from the total for finding the frequency of that particular for finding the frequency of the values for that particular response. Once we've found the frequencies for each piece of information, um, we can set up a table of frequencies. So find the frequency per e for each possible value, set it up so we can analyze it all together all at once. Here we can see that gender. Um, had 29% female, or 53% male in response to our survey. And we want to build our interpretation of that information. How does this data answer our evaluation questions or our objectives? Well, first of all, let's take a look at the trends that we see. A lot more males than females. I already highlighted that. The largest group of respondents had zero or one sexual partner in the last month. And the most common ethnicities were white and African American. The most common change in knowledge was one or two points. But what does all of this mean? Well, when we look at the number of sexual partners, we see that 21% of participants had no partners in the last month. 35% had one. If one of our objectives was to serve people who have a high number of sexual partners, maybe that was one of our program goals, but most of the people who filled out the survey reported that they um, had one or no sexual partners last month. Maybe we are not reaching our target audience. We have to think about the context of our program in order to make that call. Perhaps one of our evaluation questions is about the change in self-rated knowledge that workshop participant report, participants report. Here we can see that 80%, if you add up 31 plus 34 plus 12 plus 3, 80% of respondents showed improvement in knowledge. Yay. This is good. However, what's going on with the 2% who showed a negative change in knowledge or the 18% who showed no change? What is the context of what is going on in our workshops that might result in that kind of response? And what additional questions does this information raise? It might be, for me, one question would be, um, how, how did people start out for that change in knowledge? Did people already rate themselves a 4 or a 5? This is a 5-point scale. If people rated themselves high, a 4 or a 5, then we wouldn't be able to see a great change in knowledge, perhaps, from before the workshop to after the workshop.
Now that we found how often things occur, we want to find out what are the central tendencies of the information, the mode, the median, and the mean. The mode is the most frequently occurring value. So here, we want to find out what is the most common response. It's the same as the value with the highest frequency. So here we can see that the mode is 1 under number of sexual partners. It occurs 49 times, the highest frequency, 35% of the, of, of the time out of all of our possible response options. When we look at gender, the mode is male. It's the most commonly, most frequently occurring value on the variable gender. Median is the center value in an ordered list. So if we line up all the possible values and then split them in half, dividing all the possible responses into two equal halves, the one in the middle is the median. In this case, you have to be able to put your values in order, right, obviously. The mode we can find for any kind of information, gender, which you can't put in an order of greater, greatest to least. Um, you can't find a median. You can't line up all of the different responses. But for something like a strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree scale, you can line them up in a meaningful order and find what the center value was, the, the middle response. So in this example, we're going to find the median of the variable age new. We line up all the possibilities in order. And the total number of valid responses is 151 in this case. Therefore, the 76th value in the line is the median. We simply count up the frequencies starting at the low end until we get to the 76th value, which is one of the 25s. So 3 plus 8 plus 9 plus 12 plus 18 plus 21 plus 9 gets us past 76. So somewhere in there in 25, one of those 9 at 25 is the median value of 25. I'm going to take a moment. Please remember to pull in any questions. We have gotten some questions, so I'm going to um, look at those and see um, so one someone had a question about the quality management of data we sort of talked about data entry and then we talked about um, checking your data uh, there's a, a variety of tools you can use to uh, ensure do some quality checks on your data in addition to sort of the kinds of checking that we were talking about. And we're definitely going to go into that in the intermediate uh, data analysis webinar. So I highly recommend tuning in for that. We talk about some data validation stuff and other tricks you can use um, to do uh, quality, quality assurance checks on your data. If that doesn't answer your question, please, please send it in again. Um, and one of the questions is we want to know who had good attendance at groups. Um, good is better than half the time. Um, Um, I'm going to chat that in in a little bit, um, and possibly to the other question. I'm, I'm still learning how to use the chat feature, so bear with me as I, as, I, as I navigate that. Please continue to send in your questions. The mean, the mean or the average is a really common center. We, we talk about the average a lot. Um, in our day-to-day -day life. It is the center of a weighted list. So unlike a median where we line everything up in order, this time we can line everything up in order with a weight attached to it. The value of it makes a difference. The value that it is makes a difference. So for example, um, self-rated knowledge after the workshop. You could rate yourself 1 to a 5. First, you count the number of responses. So here we can see that two of the 149 valid responses had circled one. Then you find the weight of each value. So the, the value is one. The frequency is two. One times two is two. Two times nine is 18, and so on. When we get to the end, we find that the 
total of the weights, 2 plus 18 plus 57, et cetera, is 616. To find the average, we divide that total weight by the total number of valid responses, 149, and the average response is 4.13. On average, people rated their knowledge of HIV AIDS at the end of the workshop as 4.13. We sort of alluded to this as we go, but I want to take a moment to talk about our different kinds of data. Some data, like gender, is unordered categories. It's categorical data. There's different sort of pots that people can place themselves in. Um, but there is no order. There's no lesser or greater value. You can really only find how frequently a given value occurs or the, and the most frequent response, which is the mode. That's the only center you really can find with that kind of information. Ordered categories, sometimes called ordinal data, you can line up, but they aren't true numbers. So you can't, uh, so you can find the mode, the most frequently occurring response. You can find the median, the center value, but you can't find the mean of those. You can find the mean of truly numeric information, like the mean of the number of sexual partners, that one we've been coming back to a lot, or the mean of somebody's height, of, of a, the heights in a room things that are truly numbers that can be lined up in an, uh, in, a, in an ordered way and also are numbers. We're going to take a quick poll here. Um, what, when might the median be a more valuable center than the mean for numeric data? So thinking about the difference between median and mean, when might you actually want to use the median instead of the mean, even though your information is numeric? The response options are when you have outliers that skew the average, when you are in a hurry. Median may be easier for you to figure out. When median proves your program is meeting its objectives, or when your audience doesn't understand data analysis. Um, and, and an example that we often see in the media, which is where I thought of this idea, is people are talking about income. And, and the media reports median income far more often than it reports average income. And, and this question gets at why they do it that way. Great. You can see our results. When you have outliers that skew the average is, um, is the answer that I was looking for. And that's because when you think about income data, for example, in the United States, there's a whole bunch of people at the low end. And maybe there's a bubble somewhere in the middle um, in the 50 to 100,000 range. But then there's all these people who earn a lot of money, that 1% that we um, have been hearing so much about lately, who um, who skew the average. So the average wouldn't be very meaningful. It would be much higher than most of us personally experience, whereas the median starts to feel a lot more like what the typical American experiences. Now we're going to move on. We can add um, the centers to our frequency tables, which can start to flesh out, give us more information about um, what we're looking at and how to build when we're building our interpretation. So for example, sorry, going back one. For example, um, we can say that the mode of gender is male and the mode of race ethnicity is white, which is true. I don't find that to be particularly helpful. But when we start building, going into other kinds of questions, it can start to be really useful to add the centers because it gives you a deeper understanding of what's happening with the information. Um, in the case of how many sexual partners, the mode is one and the median is one, which means that your data is sort of lining up pretty tightly around the number one. For change in knowledge, the mode is two, but the median is one. So the most commonly occurring response is two. The middle value is one. And the mean is somewhere in between. And that starts to tell you when those numbers spread out a little bit that your data is spread out a little bit more. 
um, there isn't a clear uh, single answer that stands out. There's actually either a cluster, cluster of answers or maybe a couple of different answers throughout um, that have high response rates. We're going to move. We're going to build our interpretation further. I think I jumped ahead a little bit. I was already I was already building our interpretation on the previous slides. Um, I want to look at this one. Change in knowledge. The mode is two. The most frequently occurring response is two. The median is one. The mean is one point four five. So what's happening here? First of all, we actually have people who are showing a change in knowledge. Since we're running an HIV AIDS workshop, since we want people to report that they know a lot more about HIV AIDS prevention by the end of the workshop, a positive change in knowledge is probably a really good sign. We're, we're probably accomplishing the objectives that we set out for us, at least generally. Um, however, we still have some of those people who showed a negative change in knowledge so what's happening there? Is it possible that they assumed um, they knew more before they started, and now they realize that they know a little bit less? That's actually pretty common when you're doing a pre and a post test. We can see that. Um, or again, as I said before, maybe we started out with people who were already had a high knowledge on the topic, so there wasn't much room for them to grow. Maybe we need to think about recalibrating our program, our, our pre and post test, um, our are the topic that we're covering to be more advanced so that people have a further place to grow when they participate in the workshop. Or maybe we need to, maybe we're reaching out, the outreach that we're doing is getting people who already know a lot about the topic and we're missing those people who we might want to have in our workshop who really have a lot to learn. We're going to compare subgroups now. One of our evaluation questions is, how does self-rated knowledge of safer sex information, or HIV AIDS information, differ among people by gender? So we're going to look not at the change in knowledge, but we're looking at just how they rated themselves at the end of the program. And we're looking at it by gender. We create a new table. This time, the subgroups are the records. They're, the, they're as it were, they're the rows along the side, and the values for the question that we're comparing, um, that we're looking at are your column headers. You enter the total number of responses for each cell. So how many females rated their knowledge after the workshop a one was zero? And you do that for each intersection of gender and self-rated knowledge. Then we enter the totals. We do this as a way to check our math. Um, so the total column and the total row should add up to the same number. And then also, when we're finding our frequencies in a minute, those totals help us um, calculate that percentage. So here we have found the frequencies for each of the percentage. In this case, we're finding the frequency out of the total responses. So we could find it, you can do it as frequencies of uh, percent of total females or percent of total people who rated their knowledge too. You can do it in different ways. In this case, it's out of the whole table. Let's start to build our interpretation of what this is telling us. First of all, women tended to rate themselves pretty high at the end. Females tended to rate themselves pretty high at the end. Um, more commonly, they rated themselves a 4, but a fair number also rated themselves a 5. So we're probably doing good by the female participants in our program. On the other hand, males overwhelmingly rated themselves a 5 at the end of the workshop. So we're doing pretty well by the males in our program. Our MTF respondents, the story is starting to look a little different. Um, the most commonly occurring value is actually a 5, but I've highlighted the, the, the self-rated knowledge response options 2 and 3 because those occurred pretty frequently as well. So we have a little bit more diversity in the response among the male to female respondents. This can lead us to ask questions about the context of our program, such as, is this the population that we're really trying to reach? And do these numbers show that we're doing a good job reaching that population with our workshop? 
It might ask us a little bit about the context of the people who are coming into our program. Um, did Are we recruiting, especially compared to the male respondents, are we recruiting males who already have a lot of knowledge coming into the program and male to female folks who do not have a lot of knowledge coming into the program? So we have people rating their knowledge lower at the end, but they've actually grown. We'd need to go back and look at our change in knowledge variable to find out a little bit more about that. We can also set up a chart of central tendencies. You'll notice here that I've only pulled forward female, male, and male to female response options. The reason for that is we had so few female to male and other genders that it, that it just doesn't make any sense to draw any meaningful conclusions about that population as a subset of our overall population. Whereas there's sort of enough people who fall under these three gender categories that we, we can start to draw some meaningful conclusions. And that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind, obviously. If you only have two people, um, or rule of thumb um, is certainly anyone, if you have less than five people in a certain category, then don't even worry about including them in your analysis be, by that category because they are, uh, there's not enough people represented there to make your interpretation valid. This chart of central tendencies pretty much tells us what we already know. Um, again, the most commonly occurring response for, women, for females, the mode is a 4. Their median is a 4 and the mean is 4.09. They're pretty solidly 4s by the end of the workshop. Males, they're pretty solidly 5s. 5 is uh, the most commonly occurring. It's the middle value. The mean is just under 5. That, there's a lot of convergence there. The three central tendencies here show us that the male to female respondents are pretty diverse. The mean and the mode, the average and the most commonly occurring response are pretty different from each other. Another way to think about this is that males are more likely to respond like all other males. So men are very likely, males are very likely to respond with a, to rate themselves a five at the end and just like all the other males who are also rating themselves a five whereas MTF respondents are less likely to rate themselves like other MTF respondents. So again, more diversity of response among that subpopulation, that subgroup in this case study. Please feel free to um, chat in anything else that you notice when you're looking at this spreadsheet this chart of subgroup comparisons. We're moving on to sharing your data. First of all, you want to determine your story. So thinking back to your evaluation questions, you've built your interpretation. You've thought about the context for your data. You've thought about what is the population that you're trying to reach. Did you reach it? You've thought about what are the goals or objectives of your program. Did you reach it? How, how well did you reach it? How, how much did you fall short of those objectives? You want to determine what your story is for sharing this information with an audience. And then the audience in this case could be uh, fellow staff, it could be your board of directors. It could be um, a community group coming together to, to learn more about the program. It could be your participants themselves. General rule of thumb, pick three talking points that you want to use to share with folks. Um, this is good public speaking technique. Stay on message. Pick three things that you want to come back to, the three points that you feel like are most important. Obviously, you have to invite people to come. Strongly recommend snacks. And you want to leave time for questions at the end. Uh, as you're working with data and building your interpretation of the data, you, there will be things that you do not know by the end. Uh, there was data that you did not collect, new questions that have been raised, information that is inconclusive. So as you leave time for questions, of course, it is perfectly OK to say, I do not know we didn't get that data, or I will have to get back to you on that. Remember, as you're building your story, 
someone else looks at the same inter information, they should be able to see the same interpretation. And as you're sharing your information, you don't want to share any that is when it is obvious what that information, who that information describes. So you don't want to report um, on the survey responses for the two African American males in your program, if that is the situation that you're working with. Or in the case of a few slides ago, when when I was building the interpretation of uh, survey responses by gender, looking at self-rated knowledge by gender, I stopped building an interpretation of the female to male respondents and the other respondents because there just weren't enough people not only to make the interpretation worthwhile because two people don't speak for the whole population of folks that you're surveying, but also um, because it you might uh, be breaching confidentiality confidentiality if you're reporting on those folks. And then you are done. It's time to celebrate. It's a lot of work doing uh, analyzing data. Um, so certainly you should give yourself a big uh, round of applause or a pat on the back when you're done and are able to present your findings to folks. Um, we build, we do evaluation because we want to improve our programs. So it is important um, to get people on board with us. This is why it's so important to share our findings. We want to be able to have other people have buy-in with us to reflect on what we've done so far and to make a plan, an action plan, moving forward. And thinking about that for you all, please take a moment to chat in using the question feature. Um, one piece of information or one reflection um, that you might use, excuse me, one reflection you have about the information that we presented in this webinar. So this is a, a traffic light reflection that I use in my work with after school sometimes. The red light, what is one thing that you will uh, stop doing? Yellow light, what is one thing you will continue doing? And green light, what is one new thing you can do to improve your data analysis. Um, so for example, you might say green, colon, I will think about when median might give me a better score than the mean or the average. So please um, go ahead and type in your reflections on what you've learned in this webinar today and what you will take forward with you from the webinar. So as we wait for some of your responses about your red light, yellow light, and green light, just want to remind you a little bit about some further resources that are available to you. Capacity for Health has an online resource library where we archive recordings of our webinars. We also will have the online training module version of today's webinar if you want to recommend it to others of your colleagues or friends. We have a lot of links there for other materials. We have information sheets that sort of summarize everything we talked about today in a handy two-page or three-page or four-page handout that makes it really easy to share and to remind yourself and come back to the points we've talked about today. So please check out our online resource library. The web link is on your screen right now. There's also some really great resources at the University of Wisconsin Extension Program. They do a great job in building capacity around program evaluation. And there's specifically some tip sheets on analyzing data that you might find helpful. And again, the web link is on your screen right now. So just to talk a little bit more about some of our other capacity building services, um, and just a reminder that today's webinar is part of a three-part series. So the next section, Intermediate Data Management Analysis, is going to be on Wednesday, May 2nd, same time. And part three is really about um, the visual presentation of data, so letting our data speak. We're going to talk about uh, sort of a new field called data visualization. So same way to register that you did register for this is available online, and information about these webinars is also available online. And lastly, just in terms of further resources, I want to um, remind you that we are available for free individualized capacity building assistance. You can um, find out more about that on our website, capacityforhealth.org, and also you should feel free to email or call me directly. I'm a capacity building specialist here at Capacity for Health. 
So I'm going to go ahead and pass the headset back to Jessica in case there are questions that she would like to answer verbally. Also, just to remind all of you who are still on with us that you can also click on your raise the hand icon if you'd like to ask your question live. This does conclude the content of today's presentation, but we will stay on the line either um, responding to questions that you chat in or letting you ask questions live and answering them live. So I'm going to pass it back to Jessica to answer some questions. Thank you. So I'm, I'm chatting in a response to a couple of the questions, and I wanted to um, uh, address some of the other ones that I wasn't entirely clear about, so if people could resend them. Someone asked um, to re-explain mean or average. Uh, the, if you line up a series of values, um, in the example I chatted in, uh, say you had two people respond with a value of 1, they rated their knowledge 1, and you had four respond with 2, you would take the weights of those. So the two people who responded with 1, each one weighs 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. The four people who responded with a 2, each of those four people weighs a 2 in this case, so 4 times 2 is 8. Then you would add up those total weights and divide by the total number of people, which ends up being 10 divided by 8. Anyway, you can see in the chat um, the math on that, uh, but that is how you find a mean or an average. It's different than a median where you line everybody up and the weight of the value doesn't matter. So if you lined up 1 plus 1 plus 2, or 1 and 1, 2, 2, 2, and 2, the median is a solid 2. It's the center value in the middle of that lined up list. Um, and as you can see, the slides will be available and will be sent to you. Someone asked, we want to know who had good attendance at groups, and good is better than half the time. That's an excellent, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I misunderstood that one. Um, are there any other questions that are Than someone asked to see the chart for the mean and the average again. So we're going back to that right now. So let me know if this is the right one that you wanted to be looking at. Um, so in this example, um, and I'll, I'll just scroll through it again, we have folks who are rating their knowledge on a 1 to 5 scale. So the first row, the 1 is the possible rating. It's the, it's the, the value they're rating it, sorry. It's the value that they could be circling on their, work, on, their work, on their survey. Two people circled 1. So the weight of all the 1s is 2. You could also circle a 2. Nine people circled 2. The weight of all the 2s is 18. The weight of all the threes is three times the 19 people who responded, that's 57, and so on. So then the total of all the weights is 616. So we're adding 2 plus 18 plus 57 plus 224 plus 315, and we're getting 616. It's the total of all the weights. Then we divide by the total number of people who responded. So all the responses weigh 616, but only 149 people responded. So we divide 616 by 149, and we get 4.13. The average, sorry, the average response to their self-rated knowledge is about a 4. I hope that that was helpful to go, um, go through that one more time. If there are any other questions, please do uh, chat them in or raise your hand if you're on the telephone, and we can respond to them. I wanted to um, – I'm scrolling through, and I apologize if there's –
I wanted to go back to this one here. This is a slide when we were talking about mode, um, which what I'm going to say is not about mode at all, but it is about thinking about building your interpretation of your information. So here we can see that of the total people who responded, 30 people said that they had zero sexual partners last month. Great. 49 said they had one, and 20, and 20 or more, um, 20 said they had two, 24 said they had three, and so on. We had a few people who had had some had a lot of sex last month in this survey. Um, but we are, what we find is about 56%, so the frequency is 21% of folks responded with zero sexual partners, and 35% responded with one sexual partner, so about 56% had zero or one sexual partners last month. What if we want to be reaching people who are having a lot of sex? Hmm. Well, maybe 56% is a pretty high number of people who are either monogamous or not having sex at all, at least as of last month. Um, but conversely, 44% had multiple sexual partners last month. So whether that number meets your objective, of course, depends on what the goals for your program are, um, what population you've set out to reach is 44% of people who had multiple sexual partners. 44% of your participants had multiple sexual partners last month. Is that meeting your goal of the kinds of people that you want to serve? Um, and again, you'd have to compare this to the context of the population you're working with and, um, and your goals and objectives to draw a conclusion about that, which you can then report out to your Is this, so it looks like we had a request for this chart, or is it the one with the bell? Ah, uh, yes, okay, this one, hopefully. Um, so this is a chart that, that shows um, Great, I'm glad it looks like this is the right one. Um, this is the chart that shows a normal curve. Um, so when you're interpreting information, especially when you get into inferential statistics, this we use this chart a lot, um, or thinking about this particular shape a lot. Um, but what this says is, this is sort of to give the, the look and feel of, if you weighted a list, what that might look like when you chart it. If there are no further questions, then um, we'll go ahead and bring back the slide that shows further resources. Please check out the online resource library at capacityforhealth.org, library.capacityforhealth.org. I have spent a lot of time there myself. It's got amazing resources on it. Um, so. I highly, highly recommend that you spend some time there scrolling through all the different kinds of available resources. And I do hope, I think, it'll be great to have many of you on the Intermediate Data Analysis webinar in a couple of weeks, Wednesday, May 2nd. We're going to be talking about <coughs> more data management tips, more uh, quality assurance tips in particular, but also some Excel functions and formulas that you can use to do your data analysis. And then several weeks later, we're going to be talking about tips, tips for presenting data effectively um, and beautifully, I hope. So thank you all very much. And um, hopefully we'll see several.